Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this talk that will be about securing Python project supply chain. So uh, a few words about ourselves. Uh, my name is Maya. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat in the Emerging Technology Security team. And hi, uh, my name is Fridolin. I used to work at Red Hat. I used to work at Datadog. I'm an entrepreneur now. And uh, you can find more information about us on Twitter, Mastodon, or uh, GitHub. OK, so let us start this talk with a simple question, which is why protect, uh, protecting your supply chain actually matters. So if you follow open source security or maybe Python news, uh, you might have seen this information pass, which is that um, not too long ago, PyPI maintainers decided to temporarily um, deactivate new user, user registration uh, on the index and also uh, the upload of um, new packages, of new projects, because they got overwhelmed with the volume of malicious packages that got uploaded on, on PyPI. So they could handle it, uh, everything, it was very overwhelming for them. So they had to suspend uh, all those uploads. And maybe um, a little more, uh, less recently in January, you might have seen uh, that PyTorch, uh, the famous machine learning library was uh, compromised. Um, some nightly bit of, of PyTorch was the victim of a dependency confusion attack. So we'll uh, see what a dependency confusion attack is later in this talk. Uh, but this is also a supply chain attack. And uh, this is not a coincidence if you have seen all those uh, articles passed recently, because um, a study showed that year to year, uh, for the past three years, supply chain attacks have increased by more than 700%, which is a very high growth rate. Um, supply chain attacks can cause a lot of damage to an organization or a project, can be both financial and also reputational. And uh, if you have a weak supply chain, this can get, get you into a lot of legal and compliance issues as well. Um, so some new regulations were put into place to try to secure uh, software supply chains, and one of the most famous ones was uh, issued in 2021 by President Biden. And this was the Executive Order uh, 1421. Uh, it was called Improving the Nation's Cyber, Cyber Security, and it was issued after uh, the pretty infamous solar winds attack, uh, which affected a lot of big organizations and some branches of the United States uh, federal government. Uh, and this uh, executive order basically um, tells corporations that uh, collaborate with the US government that they should be uh, more strict about supply chain standards they adopt. So for example, uh, it pushes organizations to adopt uh, secure authentication uh, to servers, or maybe like stricter protocols uh, and this kind of things if they want to sell software to the government. And this includes things like software bills of materials that we'll cover later, uh, which are, are basically uh, like a list of the ingredients that compose your software. Okay, so now let's take a look at supply chain threats and vulnerabilities. Uh, Maya already mentioned infamous SolarWinds attack. Uh, it was an attack on SolarWinds Orion platform that is uh, quite well used. Uh, it's a network performance monitoring platform. And what was uh, done here, attackers basically uploaded a malicious DLL file that was subsequently pulled by a build system which produced uh, software artifacts that were uh, consumed by customers. These software artifacts were properly signed, so customers were not aware that there was some malicious behavior. And uh, the effect of this attack was quite large. So more than 18,000 customers were affected, and uh, more than 400 of US Fortune 500 companies were affected by this attack. You can see, for example, the White House or Pentagon or State Department or National Security Agency that was affected by this attack. Uh, what happened? Uh, SolarWinds stock price went down. That's not the worst thing, but attackers were able to access confidential information of uh, customers. What could SolarWinds do better? Uh, they could follow Salsa framework. Uh, Salsa framework is quite recent. Uh, quite recently, it 
went to version one. Salsa stands for supply chain levels for software artifacts, so it's not a source, it's not a dance. And Salsa defines four levels, starting from level one, where there are basically no requirements on the build platform, up to uh, level three, uh, which is like properly hardened uh, build platform. Salsa introduces this uh, image. So you can see there's a producer that produces source code, and the source code is stored uh, in a source repository. Then a build platform pulls sources, pulls dependencies, and uh, creates a package or the resulting artifact that is subsequently consumed by consumers. Uh, Salsa defines threats in each step, so what can go wrong, but also defines how to prevent from uh, these threats. So how to, uh, for example, uh, prevent from submitting unauthorized code or uh, make sure that the source repository is not compromised. Now let's take a look at some uh, toolbox to protect uh, your uh, Python projects. So the very first uh, toolbox thing we will talk about is stuff. Uh, it's the update framework. Uh, it's called TUF uh, because it solves TUF problem and that is uh, basically securing updates and preventing temporal attacks, rollbell attacks, or key compromise uh, attacks. The reference implementation is based on Tandy. That's an updater that was used in Tor. Uh, TUF is, let's say, more generic, but borrows many ideas from uh, Tandy. There is also Uptain that is uh, Similar project to TAF that is used in automotive industry. It's used uh, by companies that uh, populate updates to, car, to cars. Uh, the reference implementation of TAF is in Python. You can find it under Python TAF. And one company, uh, Datadog, uh, used TAF to secure agent integrations, the software that is shipped to customers, and uses TAF and Intoto that we will talk about later to securely ship software to customers. There were also efforts uh, like PEP 458 and PEP 480, PEP meaning Python Enhanced Proposals, to secure uh, PyPI itself, and we will talk also about it. Uh, TAF is also used in Zigstore to securely download public keys for instances of Zigstore. Uh, I already mentioned Intoto. So Intoto is a framework to uh, secure supply chain. What it does, it basically defines what each step in a pipeline should do. So if a pipeline should, uh, for example, write something or uh, package something, then there is created attestation, so you are sure that each step in a pipeline performed desired task and is properly signed. So users who consume resulting artifacts can verify that each step in the pipeline, each step in the chain uh, did its job properly. Now. Okay, uh, so now let's go to an important part of every supply chain, which is code signing. Uh, and for this part, I would like to introduce a quite new project uh, when it comes to the space of code signing, which is Sixtor. Uh, so Sixtor was started a few years ago by different institutions and companies like Google, Red Hat, and Purdue University uh, to make software signing more accessible and simpler. So uh, it provides a very secure and simple interface uh, to sign uh, any kind of codes and containers as well. Uh, and to use it, you don't need any specific cryptography knowledge, which is kind of, of an improvement if you compare it to um, other signing standards like PGP, where sometimes the configuration can be a bit complex and you might need to know about the underlying uh, cryptographic protocols that um, the tool uses to, to sign your software, which is not the case here. So um, one nice feature of Sixtor is that it uses uh, OpenID Connects to sign software instead of uh, self-managed pri private keys. So OpenID Connect is uh, an authentication protocol. And what it allows you to do is to bind your email address or any kind of ad identity, like for example, uh, GitHub uh, workflow run to your signature. So instead of having a permanent public key bind to it, you can have something more identifiable for your end users, uh, like your email address and more personal. Uh, Sixtor has a client implementation in Python. Uh, it's called Sixtor Python and you can check it in, on GitHub. Um, 
So it's a pretty good tool. Uh, it has a lot of integrations, like, uh, for example, with GitHub uh, CI runs. You can use it, use it as a GitHub action. You can use it as well as a CLI. Uh, and I put an example on this side of uh, what it looks like to sign with Sixtor Python. So it's very simple, as you can see. Uh, if you want to sign a package, let's say a Python package in this case, uh, the only thing you need to do is enter Sixtor sign your package. And then it will redirect you to um, an OIDC session. So basically, this is a web browser page that opens up. And you need to enter your credentials to an identity provider, which is, for example, Google or GitHub, which are currently supported. Uh, enter your password to authenticate. And then it will validate your identity and bind it to uh, the signature of your artifact. Here's the package. Um, so you send your art artifacts. And the second step is for your, your end users to verify the signature. Uh, so here again, it's quite simple. Uh, this is a second command. You just need to run uh, six door verify here identity, and uh, you need to pass the email address of the signer, uh, which can be found on the signing certificates, which is provided by six door. And you need to pass as well the URL of the OIDC provider. So here, for example, um, the signer identified with GitHub accounts, so you will need to pass the corresponding URL. And just the, what we call a bundle file, which basically is uh, some kind of verification file uh, that contains all the materials you need to verify a signature with Sixtor. OK, so before we skip to the next part, I would like to uh, make a quick reminder about the difference between uh, what is malicious and vulnerable. So uh, a vulnerability in software is some kind of flow in a computer system that can weaken the overall security of the system. Uh, but the thing with vulnerabilities is that um, they can be exploited, but they are not always exploitable. And actually, some study found that less than 10% of uh, vulnerability are actually exploitable, um, and less than 1% of them are actually exploited. Uh, on the other hand, a malicious software or malware uh, is any kind of software that is intentionally designed to cause disruption in your system. Uh, so that includes, for instance, ransomware or Trojan horses or, or viruses, for instance. Uh, so to find out about vulnerabilities that exist in uh, software libraries, for instance, you can use vulnerability databases. So here we chose two examples. Uh, the, the first one is OSV. Uh, it's a distributed vulnerability database for open source projects. Um, and what it does is, is that it, it aggregates vulnerability databases uh, from different ecosystems like Golang, Rust, or of course Python with PyPI data. Uh, and it makes them available uh, in a format called the OpenSSF vulnerability format. Uh, the second example we picked is GWAC. So that stands for Graph for Understanding Artifact Composition. Uh, and GWAC is a graph database that aggregates uh, all kind of software metadata about security, uh, like for instance, artifacts, identities, uh, attestations like s bonds we'll talk about later, and it stores the relationships between those uh, artifacts and metadata inside the edges of the graph database. So uh, GWAC is quite useful if you want to prevent supply chain attacks because it allows you to understand better the relationship between the different uh, components in your software and, the, yeah, and how they are used together, for instance. If you try to apply uh, this to the Python ecosystem, uh, there is no direct support for vulnerabilities in PIP, the Python package installer. Uh, nevertheless, there is a tool called pip audit. It uses uh, the OSV database that Maya mentioned. And what it does, it audits already installed Python environments. So you can issue pip audit and it will show you vulnerabilities, but also packages that introduce these vulnerabilities to your environments. There was also an experiment called pip cuddle. Uh, it basically resolves application dependencies uh, with uh, without vulnerabilities or only with vulnerabilities that are acceptable ones. So it uh, accepts a configuration file. In this file, you state which vulnerabilities you are fine to have in your application. And then pipcuddle resolves application dependencies. And then you can install all the dependencies, including transitive ones. Uh, 
There's also a project called Security Constraints. Uh, what it does, it consumes uh, security recommendations by uh, GitHub, so you need to provide GitHub token, and uh, it, can generate security, it can generate constraints for your application, so uh, the resolution process then uh, checks these constraints and resolves application dependencies without vulnerabilities. Uh, the PyPI uh, is quite, uh, let's say, bad when it comes to a uh, number of mal malicious packages published each day. So uh, PyPI maintainers claim that there are roughly 40 malware packages uh, introduced each day, and they need to be taken down manually. There is a data set called malicious software packages data set, and it aggregates uh, packages that were published on PyPI but were taken down. Uh, because they were malicious. So if you want to experiment with malicious code, uh, you can do so, just be careful. Uh, there was also an effort, uh, which is an open source tool called Guardoc. Uh, it scans Python source code and tries to find uh, patterns in the source code that uh, uh, can be uh, malicious. Uh, Guardoc uses some grep rules, uh, to statically analyze the source code and uh, give you information whether the given package is malicious or not. Gardoc is not used uh, on PyPI, uh, but you can use it on your own or you can plug it into your system. Uh, Maya already mentioned SBOM. SBOM was mentioned also in the executive order uh, issued by the US president. SBOM stands for Software Bill of Materials. Uh, what it does, it basically states all the software that uh, was used to uh, create or assemble uh, some uh, application. So in this listing, you can find all the dependencies, uh, their version. And there are two, uh, two formats that are used uh, in the industry, Cyclone DX or SPDX. There are more, but these are, let's say, the most used ones. If you have a software bill of material for your application, you can also use VEX, that stands for Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. And uh, VEX uh, states whether the given vulnerability that is present in your application is actually exploitable. So uh, if you have a vulnerability in your application, it doesn't mean that uh, an attacker can uh, exploit your application because, uh, for example, that vulnerability doesn't need to be on call path or uh, the application configuration prevents from uh, exploiting the given vulnerability or you uh, deploy your application into an environment in which uh, that vulnerability is not exploitable. Uh, there were two efforts. One was uh, OSV dev uh, effort to, let's say, standardize VEX in the industry. Uh, they introduce a file uh, that you can maintain in your Git repository, and that file states uh, information about uh, libraries that you have, uh, information about vulnerability and whether that the given vulnerability is maintainable or not. OSVDEV also uh, proposed a way how to, let's say, manage multiple VEX files across, across repositories so you can uh, check uh, multiple files when you are consuming uh, multiple libraries. There's also open VEX standard uh, in the industry uh, that was uh, pushed by ChainGuard, uh, ChainGuard the company, and it proposes a standard in the industry to describe uh, VEX uh, for your application. So here is an example. Uh, it basically states uh, vulnerabilities and also uh, their status and what introduced the given vulnerability. If you want to run your Python applications, you can use Python container images. So uh, Red Hat produces some uh, Python container images, UBI or Fedora-based uh, source 2 i images. The main benefit of these images is that uh, it's large RPM ecosystem uh, with vetted and very well-maintained software. You can use micropipenv in these uh, container images. And uh, on the other hand, there's also ChainGuard's Python image. Uh, it's based on Wolfi. They maintain their own ecosystem uh, for packages, and it uses multi-stage builds. So uh, you have one container image that is used for building your application, and then another one that is very minimal, just with Python runtime, to actually run your application. They try to minimize the uh, number of uh, CVEs present in the containerized environments.
Um, another thing you might want to do, uh, if you want to check for potential vulnerabilities in your source code, is use uh, static source code analysis. And uh, we picked an example here of such a tool, which is called Bandit. Uh, Bandit was started by the OpenStack security team at Red Hat. Um, and what it does is that it scans uh, the files in your Python project. And then from these files, it generates ASTs, abstract syntax trees, and uh, it uses plugins to analyze uh, the risk for potential vulnerabilities, but you can choose uh, which plugin you use. So for example, you can uh, choose if you want to detect things like hard to passwords, uh, shell injections, or crypto mining, for instance. Um, okay, so now let's go over some initiatives that the Python community uh, has taken recently to secure the ecosystem supply chain. Uh, there are a bunch of them, but we chose uh, a few uh, important ones. So the first one is uh, mandatory 2FA for maintainers of critical packages. So it is a list of packages that are um, widely used by the Python community and by developers. And um, so PyPI maintainers chose to give away for free um, with the sponsor security keys so that uh, the maintainers of those critical package can securely authenticate to PyPI and upload packages uh, yeah, in a more secure way. Uh, and more recently, they announced that in 2023, so this year, uh, 2FA will be mandatory for every package maintainer on PyPI. Um, they also have another initiative, which is Trusted Publisher, quite recent as well. Uh, Trusted Publisher uses uh, the OpenID Connect protocol again uh, for users, uh, maintainers of Python packages to um, use a, um, OpenID Connect identity to get a temporary uh, identity token, which allows them to get uh, a temporary access key to PyPI instead of the uh, normally the API key you would store permanently, uh, for example, and use uh, and reuse in CI, CI workflows to publish packages, which is a bit more insecure. Um, and one last measure is uh, pretty recent. Uh, they chose to drop support for PGP signatures from PyPI. So uh, a Python community member showed, uh, made an audit of uh, how PGP signatures were generated and used uh, in PyPI and found out that they weren't that useful uh, and were actually quite hard to maintain, so they chose to just drop support for it. Um, so now we'll go over more initiatives to come from uh, the Python community. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, improvements. Uh, we will talk about PEPs. Uh, PEP stands for Python Enhanced Proposals. Uh, that's basically a way how to describe what you want to do in the Python uh, ecosystem and then the community decides whether it's good or not. Uh, the first one is PEP 458, that's about securing PyPI do downloads with signed repository metadata. This one was accepted and it uses stuff, the framework that we discussed uh, before and uh, it basically secures downloads of Python distributions so you can be sure that you are downloading the right software uh, from PyPI if you are a PyPI consumer. The, it's still a uh, work in progress. Then there is PEP 480 uh, that's uh, about surviving a compromise of PyPI. So imagine someone compromised PyPI and uploads packages uh, there, own packages. How do you want to uh, check that? Um, this PEP describes uh, a way how to do it. It's based on PEP 458, and it adds uh, developer, developer keys to warehouse or PyPI. Uh, currently, it's in a draft state. Also, there might be a new PEP uh, in a few days, so stay tuned. Uh, now, let's talk about dependency confusion attack. So, at the beginning of presentation, we described one dependency confusion that happened in the PyTorch ecosystem. So, if you are a user and you install Flask and Torch, uh, or PyTorch uh, from uh, two indices, let's say PyPI and PyTorch. Uh, you want to consume PyTorch from PyTorch because uh, there are, let's say, special builds that you would like to use. Uh, in the Python ecosystem, these indices are treated as mirrors. So it doesn't really matter for PIP or potentially other installers which index uh, is used to consume a package. So uh, in your uh, example, you would like to install Flask and Torch and also transitive dependencies of these libraries. But uh, 
which index should be used. So imagine that uh, in this case, uh, you are consuming torch from the PyTorch index and a dependency of torch called torch Tritron also from the PyTorch index. But if you are, in a, uh, if you are an attacker and you upload a package to PyPI with the same name as uh, the one on PyTorch index, uh, then it can cause troubles because these indices are mirrors, right? So uh, the torch return can be malicious and you can consume malicious package. If you would like to detect possible dependency confusion uh, in your Python applications, you can use a tool that is called Yorkshire, so uh, a cute name, right? Then there is another PEP called for extending the repository API to mitigate dependency confusion attacks. That's basically the PEP that's addressing these dependency confusion attacks. It's still in draft state, but what it introduces, it introduces a way how to uh, create a contract between indices. So imagine PyPI says uh, that uh, project Torch Tritron is uh, trusted on PyTorch and PyTorch index says Torch Tritron is trusted on PyPI. So there is a contract between these indices and consumers or installers of packages can verify that these packages are uh, or trust each other. So they can pull from PyPR or PyTorch. Uh, if uh, there is no these tracks information, then the installer can fail and notify about possible dependency confusion. Another PEP called Recording the Provenance of Installed Packages, that's PEP 710. Uh, it's based on PEP 610, recording the direct URL of installed distributions. So if you install a Python application and you install it using a URL, so let's say you use GitHub to uh, download an archive uh, of PIP, uh, then uh, PIP and other installers create a special file called direct URL JSON in a metadata directory called this info and uh, track information that you installed pip from uh, GitHub. And this is the URL, this is the hash of file. Nevertheless, there was no way how to find out uh, what you actually installed if you issued just pip install uh, pip or flask or whatever application or whatever library. So PEP 710 introduces a new file called provenance URL JSON that states uh, what file was downloaded, uh, what were the hashes, when you installed packages using their name and optionally their version. It also tracks information about indices. It's still in draft state, but uh, if you are interested in it, feel free to check it. And now we will have an opportunity to win something. So for those who were listening to us, uh, there can be something good. Uh, so the rules are, we will ask a question. Uh, I will try to check who raises hand the first, and then we will give something. Does it sound okay? Yes? Okay, let's do it. So the first question, to which project mentioned in this presentation does this photo relate to? Sorry. Salsa, yes. So we have a winner. And <laughs> so that's right, you have like mild salsa deep. <laughs> Together with just Okay, so another. To which project mentioned in this presentation does this photo relate to? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Can you guess also the price? <laughs> <laughs> we actually borrowed this idea from uh, Guac people, so uh, developers behind Guac. Yes, so Guac, Graph for Understanding Artifact Composition. Okay, to which project mentioned in this presentation does this uh, photo relate to? Anyone? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait. 
Okay, so the price is, uh, yes, so salsa is uh, the correct answer. And you get a ticket to salsa lessons, so you can choose between Maya or me. <laughs> okay, okay, there's also plan B, so. Yes. <laughs> so, hot salsa it is. Okay, to which project mentioned in this pre presentation? Yes, we have? Yorkshire. Yes, it's Yorkshire. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a dark story, but... So... <laughs> it could be also Gardok. So, what do you want? It's a lollipop. Okay, and now the tough one. To which project mentioned in this presentation does this photo relate to? It's a very hard one, so feel free to propose any. No. Uh, yes? No. No, that's not it. <laughs> okay, a hint? Yes. You win chocolate. <laughs> we wanted to ask uh, for signatures of uh, Zig Store guys, but maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> Stickers. Oh, that's that's a good idea. We don't have any Zig Store swag, so yeah, maybe next time as well. And I think we have some space for questions, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So I'll repeat the question. So uh, I mentioned that there probably be some PEP, uh, like new PEP. Uh, so uh, I collaborated with uh, one PyPM maintainer that's Donald Stuffed, and uh, there is something written. So let's see if it will be public or or not. Uh, there are also other engineers involved. So for example, Trishan, who is behind uh, Tuff, and uh, other people. So let's see if it go public. Yes? Uh, when you mentioned that they were removing BPP from MyPI, it kind of implied that there is something actually harmful about it, like the, what people were doing. Okay, so I think if you want a complete answer, um, William Woodruff uh, published an article about it, which is uh, pretty explicit, and he uh, gives details about the, the whole audit he did on PyPI about uh, GPG signatures. I think it's called something like uh, GPG signatures worse than useless. So that's pretty explicit as well. Uh, so I encourage you to check it if you want uh, a really complete answer on why uh, GPG signatures were not worth maintaining anymore. Yes? Oh, yeah, sorry. I just repeat the question for... Uh, so the question was, uh, why exactly are GPG signatures uh, not considered worth uh, maintaining anymore by, by PI? Sorry, yes. Okay, so the question was, uh, if I understood, if we consider ChatGPT as a tool to prevent malware, right? And does there is a tool called Package Hunter that can help detect vulnerabilities, is that correct? Or, yeah, Package Hunter or similar, like runtime, let's say, by executing the... Okay, the runtime vulnerabilities, okay. Um, I have not considered ChatGPT personally uh, as a tool. For this talk, at, at least, we didn't uh, provide any example. Um, I, I'm sure 
some tools use it now, uh, but honestly, I didn't search into it. I don't know if you if you did. Okay. Uh, no, we haven't considered it yet. Okay. Thank you.